tonight. India's ethnic conflict. Fresh ethnic clashes in India's Manipur causes civilians and authorities to be vigilant after six bodies found. Snow blankets Korea. Korea faces heaviest snow for any November in 117 years in Seoul. Ceasefire begins. Thousands of Lebanese head home as Israel Hezbollah ceasefire takes hold. And meeting with the past. Ancient Greek liars make a comeback as a family of musicians are recreating replicas of the ancient instruments. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ada Derana World News Tonight. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We are here to bring you key stories across the globe for this Thursday and we begin today in India. India's northeastern state of Manipur is on high alert after authorities recovered the bodies of six women and children who reportedly belong to the majority Meite community. Meite groups have alleged that they were kidnapped and murdered by armed groups of the minority group of Kuki ethnicity. The news sparked a fresh wave of violent protests prompting authorities to snap internet services in some parts of the state over the weekend. The two ethnic groups have been locked in a deadly ethnic conflict since last May, which has killed 200 people and displaced thousands. On Saturday, protesters ransacked and tossed the houses and offices at least a dozen lawmakers, mostly from the state's governing Bharatiya Janata Party. Police have arrested at least 23 people in connection with the violence, and authorities have imposed an indefinite curfew and suspended internet services in the Meite dominated Impal Valley and Bishnupur district. At least 20 people, both Kukis and Meites, have died in flare ups that have erupted between the two ethnic groups this month. On Friday, police reportedly recovered six bodies, and though they have not confirmed their identities, rumors spread that they were the same Meite family setting off a wave of violent protest. Protesters and civil society groups are demanding that authorities put an end to the atrocities and take strong action against the armed groups operating in the state. Violence broke out in the streets of Pakistan again when protesters stormed the capital demanding the former Prime Minister Imran Khan's release. Pakistan's security forces then launched a sweeping midnight raid on Khan supporters with hundreds arrested amidst chaotic scenes. Now, to get the latest on the story, we have other than a world news special correspondent, Amar Gauss, joining us from Karachi, Pakistan. Thank you, Mikla. Thousands of, protests, uh, thousands of protesters from the Pakistan Tehreek e Insaf party stormed into the capital city of Islamabad last week, demanding the release of jailed ex Prime Minister Imran Khan. Defying a lockdown, the protesters broke through the security gates and clashed with the police near Dichau, which is an important uh, city centre located nearby government buildings such as the Prime Ministerial Office. The forces used tear gas and rubber bullets to disperse the crowd, whereas the protesters used sticks and stones to clash with the police. Ahead of these demonstrations, authorities detained nearly 4,000 protesters from all across Pakistan to, pro uh, to prevent the unrest from happening. Government has also suspended mobile, uh, also suspended mobile and internet services, uh, severely disrupting communication all across Pakistan. As of Thursday, WhatsApp backends are still restricted, leading, uh, making it difficult to share voice notes and photos and other media as such. Protests began on Sunday uh, and saw convoys converging from all across Pakistan to the, to the capital city of Islamabad, uh, with the largest one being led by Bushra Bibi, five, uh, Imran Khan's wife, and the chief minister of the Khyber Pakhtunkhwa uh, province, uh, Ali Amin Kadapur, which came from Peshawar. After days of unrest, PTI called off the protests on Wednesday and life is slowly returning back to normal in Islamabad. The roads and motorways to Islamabad are now being reopened after four to five days of closure. However, all of this comes with a heavy toll. As per the official reports, four rangers were killed, while many other police officers and other officials were injured during the clashes. Flight schedules were also heavily delayed, leading to many travelers being stranded in the airport for many hours. Imran Khan, the former, uh, for the former Prime Minister of Pakistan, has been in custody since May 2023 on corruption allegations. 
he also has over 150 charges against him, which his party claims to be are politically motivated. These events indicate as to the deep political divisions that run across Pakistan and the ongoing turmoil. Back to you, Mekala. Thank you to Adhidhar Nawal News Special Correspondent Amar Graus from Karachi, Pakistan. People in South Korea woke up to a huge pile of snow this morning and the rare November heavy snowfall is the highest recorded ever for over a century. The first snow of the season fell heavy. On Wednesday, the Seoul Meteorological Observatory said the heaviest snow accumulation of the day reached nearly 20 centimeters during the daytime. That's the heaviest snow recorded on any day in November since 1907 when such observations were first made. The previous record was 12.4 centimeters in November 1972. One expert explains why this happened. Cold air passing over the West Sea created snow clouds due to the sea air temperature difference. The sea surface temperature was 2 to 3 degrees Celsius higher, intensifying the snow clouds. And along with the expanding Siberian high pressure system, this time the snow clouds followed the westerly winds into the capital region unexpectedly. The morning commute was especially crowded with traffic at a standstill in many areas. Other areas in the country, such as Gangwon-do province, also saw a lot of snow, leading to accidents, including a car crash on the Seoul Yangyang Expressway that resulted in one person dead and six injured. Scores of flights departing from domestic airports were also delayed or cancelled. Due to the heavy snow, the Interior Ministry activated Level 2 of the Central Disaster and Safety Countermeasures Headquarters response posture and strengthened related measures. It also raised the heavy snow warning to alert. President Yoon song yeol ordered related authorities to mobilize all snow removal personnel and equipment to prevent accidents and traffic congestion. He also ordered an increase in public transportation during peak hours. And the Korea Meteorological Administration predicted the heavy snow will continue across the country until Thursday morning. The ICC prosecutor has sought an arrest warrant for Myanmar's military leader over alleged crimes against humanity and persecution of the country's Rohingya minority. A million Rohingya fled to escape a Myanmar military offensive launched in August 2017. It's a military campaign UN investigators described as a textbook example of ethnic cleansing. Soldiers, police and Buddhist villagers are alleged by UN investigators to have raised hundreds of villages in the remote western Rakhine state, torturing residents, carrying out mass killings and gang rapes. Myanmar has denied the allegations and says security forces were carrying out legitimate operations against militants who attacked police posts. More than a million Rohingya refugees now live in squalor in camps in Bangladesh. Rohingya activist Shahat Zia says the ICC should act on the arrest warrant immediately. In a statement, the prosecutor's office said that more applications for arrest warrants relating to Myanmar will follow. A panel of judges will now decide if there are, quote, reasonable grounds to believe General Min or Lang bears criminal responsibility for the deportation and persecution of Rohingya in Myanmar and Bangladesh. Well, let's go for a short commercial break now. More world news on the other side. On the road to the White House tonight. Numerous bomb threats have been made against the U.S. president-elect Donald Trump's cabinet nominees for his incoming administration. The FBI said it was aware of the bomb threats as well as spotting incidents. The U.S. police are investigating. Carolyn Levitt said in a statement that the threats were made on Tuesday night and Wednesday morning. While the FBI said it was aware of numerous bomb threats and swatting incidents targeting Trump's government nominees. The alleged threats were made to Trump's pick for U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, Elise Stefanik, and the nominee for the head of the Environmental Protection Agency, Lee Zeldin, while Brooke Rollins, nominated to lead the Department of Agriculture, as well as Scott Turner and Laurie chavez Derrima, Trump's pick for Department of Housing and Labor Secretary, respectively, posted on social media that they have also received threats. Now, Fox News also reported that Defense Secretary nominee Pete Hegseth and Trump's pick for Director of the CIA, John Ratcliffe, also received threats. 
The spokesperson for Trump's transition team added that these appointees were targeted in violent, un-American threats to, to their lives and those who live with them, while saying the violence will not deter us. Three Americans were freed in exchange for a Chinese intelligence officer who was serving a 20-year sentence in the United States and they are being reunited with their families for the first time in many years. Three Americans, one held for more than 12 years in a Chinese prison and sentenced to death, are free, part of a prisoner swap. The American held the longest, Mark Swedan, from Houston, was arrested in Beijing on a business trip in November of 2012. Chinese police charging him with drug possession, but providing no evidence, sentencing him to death in 2019. His mother releasing an emotional video during his incarceration. Kai Lee, a Long Island, New York businessman, has been held since 2016 on espionage charges. His son Harrison pleading for help to win his father's release during a congressional hearing in September. And John Leung, held since 2021, charged with espionage as well. The 79-year-old sentenced to life imprisonment. He had been an FBI informant, according to the New York Times. The Biden administration had been in highly secret negotiations for months, including a private meeting between President Biden and Chinese President Xi Jinping in exchange for the Americans Three Chinese prisoners held in U.S. jails were released, including a Chinese intelligence officer, a spy caught in an elaborate sting operation by the FBI. Updates from the Middle East now. A ceasefire between Israel and the Lebanese militant group Hezbollah has come into force in Lebanon, bringing a potential end to a more than a year of fighting. Celebratory gunfire was seen on the streets of Beirut as the ceasefire came into effect at 4 p.m. local time. Celebration and relief on the streets of Beirut today as the ceasefire between Israel and Hezbollah begins. The thousands of citizens who fled yesterday's massive bombardments in central Beirut flooded back into the city. And those displaced from southern Lebanon finally returning to what's left of their homes. We've been in touch with Gia since she evacuated over two months ago. Despite the loss, they are determined to rebuild. Oh my God! And there was huge loss. Nearly 4,000 people killed, thousands of homes leveled. Hezbollah is selling this as a victory, stopping an Israeli occupation, inflicting heavy losses. But Israel says the group has been set back decades, with its leadership decimated during weeks of bombardment and intense military assault. And now its northern residents are getting ready to head home too. The war in Gaza, though, is not over, with no ceasefire in sight. Civilians there continue to live in horrific conditions. Now they look on with faint hope. Zaki tells us, we also want peace, and God willing, there will be a truce and the war will stop. Enough is enough. Rainstorms flooded the tents of Gaza's displaced families in Khan Yunis as many were taking to the beach to escape bombing. These devastating conditions and approaching winter are raising humanitarian concerns. They ran from the bombs only for the sea to come for them. The storms rippling through the region, blowing away tents, soaking what few belongings the displaced of Gaza have left. Here in Khan Yunus, tarps became makeshift homes on the shifting sands of the beach. But the elements all but destroyed them. Children here pick canned food from the sand, floating in trash-filled water. The sea will kill us, says this woman. They live 17 to a tent here. With winter coming, the winds are stronger. Plastic trash bags flapping in the wind. The air getting colder. Nature unforgiving, even toward the most vulnerable in its path. I have no clothes for her. They're all wet, says mother Ahlam Jamal, <laughs> holding her five-month-old daughter. In a football field in Gaza City turned camp for the displaced, dark clouds hang over the tents. Rain 
is in the forecast. And the residents trying to insulate their tents, doing what they can to keep the water out with old rolled up rugs. A woman who's lost her husband and son cleans a coffee pot with the sand, with no warm clothing or sanitation or clean water. They say they're on the verge of freezing. Temperatures here can dip into frost overnights. Death would be better than this life, she says, as the bombs continue to fall. Moving over to the Russia-Ukraine war now, Russia has launched a massive missile attack on energy infrastructure across Ukraine. Ukraine's energy minister says emergency power outages have been introduced as explosions are reported in several cities across the country, including Kyiv. Now, for a detailed report on the story, we have other than a world news special correspondent, Minoli Zagaria, joining us from Kursk, Russia. Minoli, tell us about the situation over there in Russia now, and has the Ukrainian government responded to the second attack on the country's energy system? Yes, Mekala. Ukrainian officials have been warning for some time that Russia has been stockpiling cruise and ballistic missiles in order to launch coordinated countrywide attacks on Ukraine's energy system. This is the second such attack this month. As usual, the attack unfolded over several hours with waves of drones and missiles flying across the length and breadth of this vast country. Ukraine's response is equally familiar. The authority implementing preemptive emergency power cuts in order to minimize damaging overloads to the country's grid. Temperature are dropping and the country has already experienced its first snowfalls. But the full force of Ukrainians' famously harsh winter has not been yet. If Russia keeps up these countrywide attacks on Ukraine's energy system as it in previous winters, then the country will once again face a challenging few months. The Russian Defense Ministry also said that Russian forces had captured a settlement in the Donetsk region. They also launched attacks on Ukrainian ammunition depots, electronic warfare stations and other targets while intercepting dozens of Ukrainian drones. Additionally, the ministry claimed that Ukrainian forces had targeted the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant and the surrounding Enagodar area with six drone strikes and two artillery attacks. Currently, the plant is still operating normally, with no casualties of damage resulting from the strikes according to the ministry. Meanwhile, the general staff of the armed forces of Ukraine reported that its troop had been involved in over 100 battles in frontline areas by the afternoon. The general staff said that Ukrainian forces continued to hold their positions and had repelled multiple Russian attacks in areas such as Pokrovsk, Kurakov and Kupyansk. Back to you. Thank you very much, Minoli. That was Adidar Navalny Special Correspondent Minoli Zagaria from Kursk, Russia. Meanwhile, Ukrainian free diver Katerina Sadurska has set a new world record in the no fins discipline of the sport. Her win is described as a triumph amid adversity as she faced numerous hardships training in war torn Ukraine. 32 year old Sadurska dived 82 meters in 3 minutes and 10 seconds off the coast of Dominica on Tuesday, breaking her own previous world record of 80 meters. Now it marks her sixth world record in free diving to date. She said that her training was not easy as she could not train in her war-torn home country, but said that she is really happy to do this dive. In the small Irish market town of Balahaddarin, a long-standing welcome to immigrants is fraying badly ahead of a general election as the country's main political parties are competing to be toughest on migrants. Ireland has long prided itself on embracing migrants, but has been shaken in the past two years by anti-immigrant riots in Dublin and grassroots protests against refugee accommodation around the country. And that has begun to seep into places like Balahadrin, which had a foreign-born population of nearly 40 percent in the 2022 census, a figure that has likely grown since. Eugene Murphy is a local candidate for parliament. The national election comes as more than 100,000 Ukrainian refugees have arrived in Ireland, the largest number per capita in Western Europe, and amid a surge in asylum seekers. 
Balahadrin's refugee support coordinator, Sahad Hussein, who is also a local barber, says he believes racism has risen there mostly due to online chatter. Police, in fact, issued a rare misinformation notice about online posts following an alleged assault on a non-national in the town. Despite the concerns, Ireland has no far-right presence in Parliament. And while there are more anti-migrant candidates running in the election, few, if any, are expected to win. Now a short commercial break, more world news on the other side. Welcome back. A North Carolina chef has organized Thanksgiving meals for more than 5,000 people, many of them hit hard by and still recovering from Hurricane Helene. Here in eastern North Carolina, the small town of Seaboard is on a big mission for Thanksgiving. Spearheaded by native son and longtime cook David Burke, who felt a higher calling to help his fellow Carolinians still recovering from Helene. The recipe called for love and grace. Operation Thanksgiving Blessings took off. Strangers eager to help families still struggling this holiday season. Kathy Brown's sister, Kim, was swept away in the floodwaters and never found. Today, they're finding comfort and healing in the generosity of Seaboard. And finally tonight, in a village in northern Greece, a musician carves out a wooden sound box before covering it with animal hide and attaching nine strings. When plucked, the instrument sounds like a guitar, but in fact it is a lyre, a traditional instrument found in ancient Greece. Komatis 41 is continuing a family tradition of making replicas of ancient Greek musical instruments based on images found on frescoes and vases dating back centuries. Komate said at his workshop, whose walls are covered with pictures of ancient instruments and their modern-day replicas, that it all started with their father, which he started as a hobby. He used to make other kinds of instruments, mainly Greek traditional instruments. At some point, about 12 years ago, the first replica instrument was made, an ancient Greek musical instrument, which was a lyre of Hermes. He said, referring to the Greek god who, according to legend, invented the instrument. Those that play the instruments today see the massive window to the past. Giorgio Stamedes, 22-year-old student who took a course on ancient Greek lyre, said in some way the lyre as an emotion creates a feeling that is otherworldly. Ancient Greek music is a way of initiation, a meeting with the past, and through it one can also open gates to the future. The instruments are brought by professional musicians, composers, academics and collectors and have been used in films including the recent remake of the Hollywood classic Ben Hur. And with that, we mark the end of today's bulletin. We'll be back with the latest updates from around the world tomorrow. Stay tuned as we've got Sanavi Mudan Naika joining you next on the Nightly Business Report. Thank you for watching. Have a good night.